Hello everyone, it's Pastor Torch, and today we are going to go through the training of the one-to-one -one challenge. And you might be asking, Torch, what is the one-to-one -one challenge? It's very simple. It is an approach to share the gospel and lead one person to Christ. If you ever notice in the Bible, a lot of the times evangelism, sharing the faith was actually done just one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus spent a lot of time just sharing the gospel, sharing the kingdom, the good news with one to one person. Like either it was a woman at the well, either it was Nicodemus, um, Peter the fisherman, Nathaniel, Psalm under the tree. So a lot of times we see this approach happen in the Bible. Yeah, there's those times where Jesus went out and preached to thousands, like the feeding of the 5,000. We see Peter on the day of Pentecost and thousands come to Christ. And that's awesome. But a lot of the time, Christians were just ministering and talking to their friends and their families and their neighbors about Jesus. And through that person getting the gospel and then somebody else getting the gospel, that's how the gospel started to spread all through the first century of the Roman, Roman Empire. So, Again, the mission of this is you as a believer are sharing the gospel with somebody who is not a believer. So it is an approach to share the gospel and lead one person to Christ. So how do we do this? How do we start this off? How, how do I get started in this? Well, there's three simple steps. Step one is prayer. How many times do we think of just actually praying and asking God, God, who do you want me to go speak to? What do you want me to say? What doors can you open for me? Prayer is the first step in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul says here in Colossians 4, 2 through 3. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Now, now get what Paul says here. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chain. So what is Paul saying there? He's saying, look, Guys, we need to pray that God opens the door, that God sets up the divine appointment because God knows the people who are ready and not ready. God knows the people's hearts and he knows who and when and what time he's going to send you to go talk to somebody about Jesus. Also notice the second thing that Paul says is that we may proclaim, Lord, I need you to give me the words on what to say. I need to trust the Holy Spirit that you're going to, at that time, in that moment, when I talk to that person, what am I going to say? And so we're praying. We're already setting that up, and we're letting God do the heavy lifting of, one, setting up the divine appointment, opening the door, and also giving us the words to say when that appointment comes. So how does this work? What are you specifically praying for? One, you're praying that God puts someone on your heart. It could be a friend. It could be a neighbor. It could be somebody you haven't even met yet. It could be a family member or a coworker. So you're just starting to ask God, who's somebody that I can share the faith with? Maybe it's somebody, you know, that you've been going in your neighborhood or you've been walking your dog or you've been jogging and you see that neighbor and you keep seeing that neighbor. For some reason, that neighbor keeps putting on your heart or God keeps putting that neighbor on your heart. So you just start praying for them. And so what are you praying? What are you praying for this person? Well, every day set aside time to pray for this pray person. Pray, number one, that the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin and their need for a Savior. Pray that the Holy Spirit will start to move on their lives, that God will open their hearts, that they'll, he'll break that heart of stone and start giving them a heart of flesh. Pray that the Holy Spirit will begin to open their heart and mind to receive the gospel message. See, you're letting God already do the first move in this, working on their heart, because that's something you and I can't do. Only God can work on somebody's heart. Then ask God, just like Paul prayed here, for that open door. Ask God for the right time and the right moment that you can share the gospel. That's what we call a divine appointment because it's an appointment that God orchestrated, that God put together. He put you and this person together for this divine meeting for you to share the gospel with them. And continually, continually, because I know a lot of times what we get scared of in evangelism, sharing our faith as believers, we're like, man, I don't know what to say. When I'm talking to this person, what do I say? What if they ask me questions? What if I don't know how to answer? Pray about that. Pray about that in step one. Start asking God, God, when that moment comes, when that divine appointment comes, because you know that person's heart, 
What words do you want me to say? What scriptures? You, you and I have to trust the Holy Spirit to do his work and to give us the words to say at the right time for that person because God knows their heart. And I think in this prayer, we have to be patient and wait on God for his perfect timing and not ours. And again, I'm going to reemphasize this. We have to trust the Holy Spirit to do his work in this person's life. It's really coming back to trust the Holy Spirit because we want God to do it so that God gets the glory. We're just his messengers. We're just his vessels. God gets the glory for this. When a person comes to Christ, God gets the glory. We were just a messenger. So that's step one. So very important, pray, begin praying. That's the first step. Step two is what's called the preparation period. And of course, we know the scripture, Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God. We are waiting for God to open the door at the right moment to share the gospel with this person. Again, it's called the divine appointment. Remember, be patient on God's timing and let God do his work in this person's life. But waiting doesn't mean you're not doing anything. There, there's things that you can be doing during this preparation stage. First of all, you got to continually pray for this person every single day in the steps that we talked about. And here's an important part. <clears throat> Not only do we speak our faith, but we got to demonstrate our faith. People need to see our faith. They need to see the love of Jesus in us. And I think maybe this is why God even has a preparation stage, so that people can say, man, their faith is real. Look how they love. Look how they show their faith. So continually show and demonstrate the love of Jesus to this person. Be friendly, be patient, be kind with them, be considerate to them, be loving to them. If you can, help meet a physical need. However, always be respectful to their privacy and maintain healthy boundaries with them. Don't be going and knocking on their door at like 3 a.m. and say, hey, it's time for you to know Jesus. You got to respect their boundaries. You got to respect their life. Be wise. That's one of the things you'll pray to God about. You know, how can I have wisdom in this? Let, the important thing is let them see Jesus working in you through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let them see your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your gentleness, your faithfulness, and your goodness, and your self-control. This is the time in this preparation to demonstrate the gospel through your actions. But be yourself. Be authentic. Let them see Jesus in you. Because if they see Jesus in you and they see something different about you, then they're going to start asking questions about what makes you different. They're, they're going to see something that they can't explain and they're going to be coming up to you and asking questions and trying to get guidance or advice about things, which will lead us into the next step. And I think it's really important is during this time, read meditate, study, and pray through the book of Romans. Now, all the books of the Bible are awesome. They're great. They're all God's word. They're inspired word of God. But I love the book of Romans because the book of Romans is one of the best books that lays out the gospel message in such detail. And I think for those that know and have studied and is really inspired by the book of Romans, we get what the gospel message is all about. I mean, for instance, the, it... Romans tells us that we're all sinners. No one's righteous. No one's good, right? But then it goes and says, but Christ demonstrated, or God demonstrated his love for us that when Jesus died on the cross, back in Romans 5. And so the gospel is so clearly found and taught in the book of Romans more than any other book. So if you start going through the book of Romans, reading, meditating on it, asking God about it, when your divine appointment comes, when it comes time to talk to that person, you're going to be so well equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the word of God that you're not even going to have to worry about what to say anyway. So I would definitely, I would encourage you during the preparation time is to really get to know the book of Romans really well. Um, be patient during this time. We got to remember that we got to let God do his work and trust in him. See, God is using this time to not only prepare them and their heart to receive the gospel, but he's preparing you and what to say to release the gospel. So God is preparing both of you. 
the one who is releasing the gospel and the one that's receiving the gospel. So the preparation is a really, really important time. But remember, just continue to demonstrate the love of God to them and keep praying for them. And then comes the moment that I think a lot of people wait for is that a divine appointment, the time that we get to proclaim the gospel message to somebody. And I think Habakkuk 2.3 it's a really good scripture to remember about this appointed time because it says, for still the vision awaits its appointed time. God has a vision to save people, right? He wants people. He says, I want all men and women to come to know the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. But he has appointed times. When you came to Christ, that was an appointed time, and God sent somebody to you. So God has that vision, but for people, it awaits an appointed time. And so we're waiting for that appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow. Wait for it because it will surely come and it will not delay. Remember, this moment is God's timing. It's not our own. This moment, now how do we know that moment's going to come? How do we know, okay, Torch, this is the moment, this is the time that I can share the gospel with this person? There's a couple of things that you, that you want to listen for, that you want to look for, that, that you can tell that God's already working on somebody's heart. Because this moment will usually be triggered by the person making a comment or asking you a question. Like, for example, what makes you so different? Why are you so happy all the time? Hey, I have to go see the doctor about a certain illness. Would you mind praying for me? That's a huge indicator. Hey, I noticed something's really different from you. Are you like one of those Christians? I noticed you go, leaving every Sunday and going to church. What, what's up with that? What's the deal with that? These are the things you kind of want to listen for. Why are you so nice? I've had one guy come up to say, man, I've really messed up. I feel so guilty. What can I do? If somebody comes up to you and says, man, I'm messing up in life and I feel guilty, boom, that is an open door because there's no condemnation in Christ, right? You can bring the gospel to them. Man, I'm really having a difficult time. I feel depressed. I feel hopeless. Any of those things are usually indicators that God is starting to open that door for you to share the gospel. So keep an ear out for a certain question or comment that can spark a conversation about your faith. And again, trust the Holy Spirit. See, you don't need to worry about what to say because you've already been in step one praying for God to give you the exact words at the exact moment. So when you start speaking, the Holy Spirit's going to start speaking through you anyway. Um, it's not a formula. You don't want to use a formula. I've had people try to be like, man, if I just had laid out the points, you don't want a formula. Jesus didn't use a formula. The apostles didn't use a formula. Peter, Paul, they didn't use a formula. Yeah, they used scripture. But notice every time these guys talk to somebody, they talk to them in a different way. Every single person Jesus talked to, he never said the same thing. To the woman at the well, he talked about worship and water and her family life. When Jesus spoke one-to-one -one with Nicodemus, he talked about being born again in the wind. When he first called Peter and he first talked to Peter, he talked to him about fishing. So how did Jesus know that? Well, he prayed to the Father. And when the moment came for the appointment, the Holy Spirit gave him the words. And so Jesus always never used a script. So just Forget the script. Throw the script out. Because if you try to use a script, you're going to come across kind of fake, not authentic. You want to be real. And um, so trust the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you the right words to say. Don't try to be preachy. You don't have to try to be a biblical scholar or try to argue theology. Look, just tell them who Jesus is and what he has done in your life. In other words, tell them your story. Just tell them your story. How did you come to faith? Hey, you might not be an expert on scripture, but you are an expert on your own story. And most of the time, that's what Peter and Paul and these guys were doing anyway. They were just like, look, this is what we saw. This is what we heard. We just witnessed these things that Jesus did. And so that's all they talked about. What have you witnessed Jesus do in your life? Just tell them that. You don't have to argue it. You don't have to debate it. You don't have to make it all preachy. You don't have to try to memorize a thousand scriptures. Who is Jesus and what has he done in your life? 
Um, one, other ex- one other thing that I do, that I try to do to share the faith with people, and I notice this kind of works, because your goal and I goal, our goal is to just share the gospel. That's the point of what God's called us to do. What they do with that is totally between them and God. And so one thing you can do is if somebody comes to you and says, man, I'm really having a hard time, I'm dealing with this illness, number one thing you can do is just say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you? And nine out of ten times, they're going to say, yes, please. For some reason, that brings the defensives down a little bit. And and when you ask somebody to pray for you, you're going to take the time to pray for them that actually shows that you care about them and you love them. So one approach I'll do is, I'll start praying for somebody. And so let's say it's Michael and he's dealing with cancer. And so I'll start off something like this. I'll say, Father God, we thank you for who you are. Father God, I thank you so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and raise from the dead. And by believing and trusting you, Lord Jesus, you've given us eternal life. And Father God, I pray for Michael, I pray for healing power and grace and favor upon him, that you will heal him of this and that you'll bring him peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what did I do there in that first part? All I did is I just inserted the gospel message into the prayer. So the guy that I was praying for totally heard 100% of the gospel message and what to do with it. That is one way you could share the gospel message is just say, hey, can I pray for you? You've acknowledged Jesus in front of somebody. You've told them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. You, you confirm that Jesus rose from the dead. You confess that Jesus was Lord. Those are the points of the gospel. And so you can definitely use that prayer approach to share the gospel. Now, what they do with that is between them and God. Now, they could come back and ask you questions and how do I accept Jesus and how do I receive him? That's awesome. Go with that. Or they could be like, man, thank you so much. That meant a lot. And they could walk away. But the important thing is, is that they heard the gospel message through that prayer. So trust the Holy Spirit on that. And trust the Holy Spirit to guide you again. Um, Be conversational. Remember to ask questions and listen to them. I mean, a lot of times in Jesus' ministry, he spent time asking people questions about their life, about what they believe. He listened to them. He listened to that woman at the well go on about her family and her questions about worship. So take, a, take an active interest in what other people believe and, and li- take time to listen to them and listen to their stories. Um, that's just a great way to show love. Somebody once said, I think it was Paul Tillich, he said, the first indication of love is to listen. So take time to listen to people and ask questions. Jesus did it all the time. And he was able to preach the gospel, and he was able to preach the kingdom to people. Um, But here's the thing. When it comes to you to talk about your faith and people asking your questions about your faith, um, be honest and be bold about your faith and say, this is who Jesus is. And tell them exactly who Jesus is. Again, you can share your story, your testimony, which is basically who is Jesus and what he has done for me. But I think... In, the, in your mind and in your heart, and if you can bring these out, it's important to bring out points of the gospel. So what is the gospel? Maybe that's the important thing because that's what you're sharing. Well, Paul defined for us what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, he says this, By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I've received, I passed on to you as first importance. This is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So that's the gospel. In Romans 10, verse 9 through 10, he said this, this is how one becomes saved through the gospel. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So let's recap that. The points of the gospel is, man, God loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his son for you. His son Jesus died on a cross for your sins. Three days later, Jesus was raised to life on the third day. 
Jesus is Lord and God, and he's asking us to surrender our lives, which is repentance to his lordship, and believing and trusting in him alone so that we can have salvation and eternal life. Now, you can say that same thing in your own words. You have to say it exactly that way, but I think it's important for them to know that God loves them, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, that Jesus rose again from the dead, and that Jesus is Lord and God, and that we believe and trust in him and only him for salvation. Again, let, and I keep emphasizing this, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. Again, sometimes when we share our faith, we might walk away from that and be like, man, I really should have said that, or man, why did I say that? That was so dumb. Why did I say that? Don't worry about that, because God has already orchestrated this. This is really important because the devil's going to try to mess you up. He's going to try to trip you up. He's going to try to make you feel guilty. He's going to say, man, you did horrible. I can't believe you messed that up. Remember, the Holy Spirit's guiding you. You might not understand why you are saying or not saying certain things. That's because God knows this person's heart and the Holy Spirit is working on them. Don't try to fit the gospel in some kind of formula. Be conversational. If you you are following the steps, if, if you are praying that the Holy Spirit gives you the right words to say at the right time and waiting for God for that divine appointment and God has been working on their heart and you say, okay, Lord, and you start opening your mouth, trusting the Holy Spirit, everything that you said in that conversation is exactly what God wanted you to say. And you can walk away with confidence that you've done exactly what God wanted you to say. I don't know why there's certain things that you weren't able to say, why there's certain things you did say. We don't need to worry about that because that's how the Holy Spirit's working. He's working that out in that person's life. Nicodemus, when Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he he had to learn about the wind. Jesus had to talk about the wind. Jesus never talked about the wind with the woman at the well. He never talked about the wind with Peter. He never talked. But for some reason, at that moment, God said, Nicodemus needs to be told about the wind. So Jesus told him about the wind and how how the spirit works like wind. Why? I don't know. God knows Nicodemus' heart. So you're going to have things like that, that God's just going to be working. He's going to be saying things through your mouth. And you're like, why did I say that? Why didn't I say that? Don't worry about it. That's God working, and that's God working on that person's heart. You're just being faithful and open and available to let God speak through you to be that messenger. So let's just say, man, they're like, man, thank you for praying with me. Thank you for telling me about Jesus. Man, I want to know Jesus. I want to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, there's something called the sinner's prayer. Now, there's a, lot of convers- there's a lot of controversial issues about the Lord's prayer or the sinner's prayer. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. Some people say it doesn't really count. Here's why I support the sinner's prayer. is because the Bible says that if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. How do you call on the name of the Lord except through prayer? Now, I'm not saying the sinner's prayer is all of your walk with Jesus, all I'm saying is the sinner's prayer is just to open the door to Jesus, right? But people have to have a moment to respond and to invite Christ into their life. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. You have to open it to him. How do you open the door of your heart to Jesus? Through prayer. So I don't know how else you come to Jesus except through prayer And that's why I support the sinner's prayer. So here's just an example. You don't have to say it in these words, but this is just an example of a sinner's prayer. Um, And you just tell people, just repeat this after me. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. And you raised him from the dead so that I can have eternal life. Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. 
I give you my life and surrender myself to you. I ask that you send the Holy Spirit to live in me so that I can live for you. Thank you for saving me and giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you don't have to say it exactly like that, but that's an example of how you can lead somebody through prayer to Christ. And really, the last step is what's called the release because something's going to have to be done with these people, right? So one, you're going to have this. They are not ready to receive Christ. Now, they could make fun of you. They can insult you. That happens. The gospel message can be very controversial. And so people can get mad and angry and upset and say you're dumb and stupid. They can insult you for Christ. Jesus says count that as a victory. That's a great thing. When people persecute you and insult you and say all kinds of evil things about you because of me, he says, man, you're great as a reward in heaven. So praise God. And what I would say is just go back to step one. Just start praying again that God leads somebody on your heart. And probably you'd still pray for that person too. Um, number two is that they just, they're like, you know what? It's cool. Your faith is your faith. Your religion is your religion. I'm just not there yet. Um, I don't know about this, but thank you, but no thank you. It could be that kind of thing. All right, man, I love you in Jesus. I'll be praying for you. Let me know if there's anything you need. Um, if you want to continue this conversation, I'm always open. You know, just, just stay open to them. And guess what? You can go back to step one. And then, man, the angels rejoice, heavens rejoice, and because that one person actually receives Christ and comes to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And man, that is just, that'll get you going all day. That, that, that's like an excitement of the week. Man, it's just, it's just a great, great feeling. And so a couple of things you can do is encourage them to come to church on Sunday. Introduce them to one of your pastors. Um, encourage them to get involved in the church's discipleship. Um, Bible studies or city groups. If they're a youth, get them involved in youth ministry. Um, get involved in some of the ministries of the church, especially the ministries that are going to teach them the word of God and help grow their faith. Um, we do have new believer material at the church that we can give them, like we can give them a Bible. Um, it's, it, there's a little brochure called What Now, which means I received Christ, now what do I do? And it's just a little guide, a little four steps on what to do now that you've received Christ. And then I think it's important for them to be encouraged to be baptized the next time your church does baptism. And then after that, when that person, you've already worked and you've already ministered and you've already shared the gospel with that one person, and you're like, what do I do now? Just go back to step one and start the whole process over again. Because you and me, this is our journey. This is the call that God has told us. And I'm going to I'm going to end this with Romans 10, 14 through 15. And it says this, How then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Guys, you're going to do great. Just trust in God. Keep praying. Remember, this is the Great Commission. This is what Jesus has called us all to do. Thank you for your time. I'm glad that I was able to have this with you. And let's go out and reach the world for Christ.